Hello, Adab and Assalamu Alaikum. Welcome to much awaited talk show, The Doctor's Couch. I'm Dr. Rahman, your dose then host. I'm a doctor for almost 13 years, working as emergency medicine physician. At work, I see a variety of patients and diseases. Some are common and few are unique. Over a period of time, I'm seeing a shift in type of patients and prevalence of some health and mental issues. A few months ago, a 16-year-old girl from an affluent background and reputable family is rushed to the emergency room by her family after she attempted suicide. Her parents were shocked, praying for her life. Fortunately, she survived. Another incident where a young man in 30s with promising future shot himself. His wife was devastated with two young children. Unfortunately, he didn't make it despite of all efforts. These incidents and many more makes us think, what's going on? Is it a problem of modern society? A part of evolution? Any underlying illness which has been ignored? Diseases of modern era? Or is it something else? Oh, we need to understand more. Today, I am joined by my two guests who are experts in their respective fields to discuss and understand more about the underlying problems of mental illness and solutions. My first guest is Imam Azhar Subedar. He is Imam and scholar at Islamic Association of Collin County. He was born and raised in Canada and graduated his 10 years of Islamic studies in UK. As a religious scholar with a master's in Islamic sciences and Arabic literature, his vision is to address current and social issues of Muslim world. Imam Azhar is the founder of Quran Trek app, the first of its kind. He has been serving the needs of Muslim communities across United States of America since 2002. My next guest is a psychiatrist, Dr. Sayed Qadri. He's practicing adult, adolescent, and child psychiatry since 2006. He graduated from residency and fellowship at Kansas University. He volunteers at ICNA and runs his own psychiatric clinic in Richardson. He has been an asset to the community and does several volunteer works in DFW. So please welcome Dr. Sayed Qadri. Uh, Dr. Qadri, let me start with you. So lately we have been uh, seeing and hearing a lot that people are talking about mental health, mental health issues, psychiatric issues. And these incidents are coming to light more frequently, partly because of media, social media. So I want to hear from you uh, how serious uh, the problem is and is the attention is getting right now, it deserves that attention. And uh, what's the reason for the rapid rise in mental health crisis? So there's a two part question. Um, so the, the first was the, the seriousness and then what's the cause of, um, so the, yes, it is a serious problem because we are seeing so many suicides in, the, in our community in general, not just the community overall. Um, there's a lot of reasons to that. Um, that there's a rise in depression, rise in anxiety, stress level. Uh, we're seeing that in our clinic too. Um, and it's, it's such a shortage. There's such a huge demand for psychiatrists. There's, we don't have enough psychiatrists or therapists. Um, like for example, somebody told me in Wyoming, state of Wyoming, we only have like five psychiatrists, the whole state. So th there's a whole shortage um, of mental illness providers. So why is this happening? Multiple reason. I mean, one uh, is that, uh, you know, there is, uh, people are coming to get help. So that's that one reason I think they're seeing that. We're seeing people saying, okay, we, we need help. And also the the whole, you know, the, the thing of um, in the past where people were interacting with each other, there was that normal normalcy that was there, but now we're seeing it's more on the internet and there's that disconnected people that's there. So they're looking for somebody to talk to. Uh, and we don't have that, uh, that personal touch. So, and I think uh, that's also that one of the causes, there's multiple causes, but uh, that's one of them. Um, and I think uh, people, as people are getting aware, they're coming for help. It's, and, and the other thing is that 
we're seeing motherliness from as small as ages three, four, five year old, six year olds. We're seeing that. Yeah, so that's, that's very shocking. Yeah, it's it's that age group. We were seeing people talking about like I'm a child psychiatrist, so I see kids and they talk about depression and suicide to me when I see them at that age. And you wonder how is like where is that coming from? So it, it's that you know it's it's that day and age. We are about society. We are about the click society. We want things instantly. And um, so, and that, that because of that, that frustration level is, it's as increasing for all of us. We want everything now and then. So that, that frustration demand doesn't mean we want that instant help. We don't have that. The frustration go builds up and that leads to your anxieties and depression. And, and then there's, there's nothing, and there's nobody to talk to. No, they don't have that. So where do they go? Um, so multiple reasons. I think that's kind of the, I see it in my clinic and my practice, what uh, is going on. Right. So it's more the modernization. The times have changed and multiple factors that leading to this rapid rise in mental health crisis. Let me switch to Imam uh, Azhar. Uh, I'm curious to know what Islam uh, has a take on mental health crisis or did it exist during the time of Prophet or during the early Muslims, or is it like a new innovation of the modern society or is it a new problem that we're facing? Uh, I would say it's a combination of both. And I want you to understand that um, when you take something apart and try to define it in separate uh, segments, uh, you over time lose the concept of a holistic view and holistic picture. So for example, back in the days when we were kids, you buy Legos, it would come in a box of a thousand pieces, 1500 pieces, and then you use your creativity to build what you want. Now what's happened is that you get these pre-made boxes that this, these pieces will build a car or they'll build a castle. And what's, what the kids are losing today is the understanding that they could build other things also. So if you understand this example, let's put it into perspective with Islam. Uh, many people ask that question, does Islam even address mental health? Islam addressed holistic existence mm -hmm. that incorporated a person's mental wellness, physical wellness, and also spiritual wellness. What we've done is that we fragmented these mm -hmm. and we fragmented in a way that you either find Muslims today who are social media, talking about taking care of the body using the hadith and saying you have to be buff and strong and go to the gym right but that then is indirectly denouncing the need of mental health uh, exactly and people who are in that physical wellness state end up committing suicide because they have separated physical wellness from their mental wellness and those who are focusing on mental wellness saying that this is something that no one's talking about are denouncing physical and spiritual wellness so in our islam in our quran there are numerous examples and in all these examples, and I don't want to go through all of them piece by piece, but there was a year of sorrows for the Prophet Wasallam. There was Yusuf Aleyhisselam being uh, seg segmented or, or segregated from society, called out for being what he wasn't. He was accused and thus he was imprisoned. That's also a mental uh, is issue that Allah is talking in the Quran. Nuh Aleyhisselam with his son, Lut Aleyhisselam with his wife, Musa Aleyhisselam running from the Pharaoh. All these scenarios talk about a mental health component to their overall situation and if you look at how the Quran addresses uh, these stories and how they were able to get through it was always in the company of people so for example Musa is running to a town he doesn't even know who's in that town he doesn't know anyone in the town he helps two women their father says bring him to me he should be our guest uh, and long story short he marries into the family he works for the family he then becomes right. the prophet and moves on but what what did he say to him that you're with me, we'll take care of you. Like we'll get you away from the hands of the evil people. The point is this, a person who's feeling mentally vulnerable or susceptible to depression and anxiety and suicidal thoughts must resort to assistance from people. They need people. We need people to be with us at that moment. And that's why the concept of Ummah, the overarching theme, not only covers mental health, it protects one's mental health beyond their physical and spiritual health. So the lack of human touch, uh, the lack of, uh, I would say, coming together as a group, uh, as a community, 
uh, that's playing a role. How do we differentiate between this evil eye or somebody is possessed? Because back in the days, if somebody actually had a depression or going through anxiety or any psychiatric issues, uh, people used to think he was possessed or was uh, affected by an evil eye, but nobody paid actual attention. So they used to go to the spiritual healers and uh, I'm not sure how uh, effective or accurate the treatments were, but uh, there was no concept of uh, this uh, psychiatric illness or mental health issues back then. So where, where Islam failed, where the Muslims, I would say Islam, I would say Islam failed, where Muslims failed was when they started uh, thinking that they could do everything themselves. Remember scholars in the past, when they studied Islam, they studied astronomy, they studied mm -hmm. medicine. Everything was a complete package. A uh, majority of the stars in our galaxy were named by Muslims, right? right. They, they had the complete package. The House of Wisdom in Baghdad was where people of different religions came together, shared knowledge, and they enriched themselves. Where I think our Islam took the wrong turn by means of Muslims taking the wrong turn mm -hmm. was when we separated Islamic scholarship from the sciences of what we've called academia, mm -hmm. right? Or we call it, uh, you know, the, the, the secular studies and Islamic studies. That concept didn't exist until the colonization of our countries. Before that, it was a complete package. What's happened is now we, as a Muslim society, demonize oh, you to Islam, but a lot of these people have learned Islam, like they're nothing. But this is a doctor, engineer, they're someone. But what we're doing is we're actively playing into breaking our society. You need both. If a person can be a doctor and a scholar is great. That's what people used to do in the past. But if not, we can't say one is better than the other. So coming down to this answer, because this is important to understand the history, is that scholarship today is basically, I know everything and I'm not going to consult you. So when cryptos became a discussion, scholars off the bat, haram, haram, haram. But did you consult with an expert? Did you sit down and just hash it out, like throw on the table? This is what blockchain is. This is what cryptos are. They're based on the value of something. Is it just, uh, is it tangible, non-tangible? Like have the whole discussion and then write up a paper saying from the scholarly perspective, after consulting expert, this is my scholarly opinion. We lost that when the Indians in Deoband started saying microphones are haram because you can't use it for prayer, or you can't listen to radio, or go on TV, or watch TV, to eat that same segment, and I'm saying it because I come from a Deobandi line of study, today they're the ones going in front of cameras. So what just happened here, we can't just write things off, off the bat. Many of the people we call spiritual healers, were they spiritual healers? Were they consulting with mental health experts? To, in, in what way? That this person coming to me is truly possessed. And that's a fact. It happens. Jadu or black magic happened to our Prophet ﷺ. Nazar, our Prophet ﷺ said that evil eye is haq. Uh, evil eye is, is true. So we cannot denounce that being a reality. However, a person who understands their zone will say, this is not for me. I'll hand it off to the service expert. Or they'll say, this isn't making sense to us according to medicine. Let's consult with a scholar. That collaboration is gone. And so that is one of the main components why we have this mindset. People saying, oh, you just have jadu on you or you have, you've been possessed without factual information, without collaboration, we're not getting a solution. Mm -hmm. And that's leading to this problem that you're talking about. People in society don't want to accept this being a problem because they feel they'll be segregated from society. Well, this person is uh, jadu, stay away from them. Well, just to add to that too, in psychiatry, um... So Imam, I agree with you because in psychiatry, that's how we talk about, uh, we divide our treatment into three parts, mm -hmm. biological, psychological, and social factors. Sure. Because these are the three factors that you have to look at it. And it, like you said, it entails the whole, um, you know, the, everything, the whole concept. Um, so then if you get the biological pieces, that's what, you, you know, that's what the part of it, you talk to a physician where they're looking at, is there about um, chemical imbalance that's going on that's causing the symptoms? And so that, that's what that biological part is. Psychosocial part is that's where you talk about looking at the psychological piece. Like what are some of the causes that the relationship, interrelationship that may have affected this, like the marital relationship, the relationship that's with your parents, 
that could have created that stress, created this depression and anxiety. The social factors, socioeconomic factors, where you are in in there. So it's that whole concept is what you know. You when you read when you read when somebody comes to my clinic, that's what we're evaluating. That's what we're looking at. We're looking at the whole bio biopsychosocial factors, and that's how my treatment plan is based on. So, so Alhamdulillah, so that's what we do when we see, I see a Muslim, and, and also research have shown that people who have uh, like suicide tendencies or suicidal thoughts, that if you have faith, you're protected. Yes. You it's, it's, it's research based. They have done research and looked at, okay, what are the protecting factors somebody who has attempted suicide or who has committed suicide? What were that? So one of the big factors was it's a faith, like somebody who believed in higher power. That I mean, that doesn't mean they have to be Muslim or Christian. Somebody who's believing in higher power. So if you have that, you're you're protected from committing suicide. So again, this whole biopsychosocial factor is very important. We have to integrate. You can't just, uh, like you said, divide. It, it, it doesn't exist. That's why I, I agree with you. Because a lot of times we see in our clinic two types of patients. One, they come in, they say, we don't want to see a therapist. We don't want to go anybody to religious leaders. We want to come to you. Give us medication. And we just want to treat our depression with our medication. And that's all they focus on, medication, medication, medication. And then we have other people that come in and they're like, they come to me and say, well, no, I don't want to be on medication. I only medication I want to take is something natural. I want to be on my vitamins or I want to go to a therapist and I don't want to do nothing with the medication. So I get these both kind of patients. And those are both our difficult patients. And I, I have seen them and their prognosis is pretty poor. Yeah. But ideal person who comes and talks to me and tells me open-minded to my feedback, hey, look, I'm going to look at chemical point of view and say, look, at evaluate you. Where is your depression? Do you need to be on antidepressant? Do you need this? And then, okay, let's evaluate it for that. And then I'm going to refer you to a therapist, somebody like you mentioned earlier, that talk therapy, that that person touch is so important. 100%. I mean, and you mentioned that earlier, but yes, 100%. In psychiatry, you have to have that. And that's one of the reasons why we're seeing this, because we're society, a very black and white. We don't have that human touch anymore. No. And, and that's where we're seeing the good, like you asked earlier, question about why we're seeing so much of it. So that's why we recommend therapy. Um, and then and then the other pieces, like if you have your, whatever your faith is, we recommend definitely going to see your religious leader talk about this. So if they do all of this, usually they end up getting better uh, and the prognosis is much better. It's that holistic approach you have to have in, especially in psychiatry. I know that every aspect of medicine needs that holistic, but specifically in psychiatry, yes. Definitely. So I'm so I 100% validated and agree. Yeah, I think that's a great thought, right? So we, as Imam mentioned, as a modern society, we need quick fix, quick uh, mm -hmm. solution to the problem. Yes. And uh, we probably are not uh, receptive or educated to look at the 360 degree angle, as you mentioned, right? So the problem is not solved only uh, my way or the other way. It's more about kind of getting everything in conjunction and see what. Mm -hmm the best, more kind of like customized approach yep. for an individual patient. Yep. yep. But you see why that's going to take long for us to have that ability to see 360 is because we've come from a culture mm -hmm. where we denied the existence of this, where we felt you can sweep it under the rug to keep <laughs> face in society. Yeah. Right. And now that rug has become Mount Everest. Mount Everest. Right. And you don't notice the rug on the top anymore. And so now it's become a problem that we what we've done is we switch from one extreme to another, mm -hmm. and we're saying it's society, it's life. You know, you go you go from a place where people say this stuff doesn't exist, we are healthy, we are good because we want to keep those smiles on in front of the people, until when it becomes so blatantly clear, we're just turning around saying, oh, everyone has mental health issues. It is what it is. So we are now accepting the existence, but we're not accepting the treatment process. So exactly. we, we're moving. We're not moving in the right direction. Yes. And so we, we have a lot of education that must be done in society to destigmatize, to uh, educate, to make people aware that, look, it's, it's okay to have these problems. It's not okay to continue living with these problems. So there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Yeah, I think you brought up a very really good point that uh, 
uh, we as a society mm -hmm. has brushed things under the carpet and it brewed so much uh, to an next point that uh, now once we see those like worse outcomes like somebody attempted suicide or anything worse happens at that point we as a society try to react and put a bandaid on it and probably that's not the solution uh, we probably have to have more uh, a preventative, a proactive approach mm. uh, to a problem so we don't end up in a worse scenarios. Well, sometimes you can't put a bad idea on, you know, respectfully, it's like you're having problems in your marriage, you're not addressing it, it's each of you have a problem, and then the end up result is we got divorced. He's saying she was a problem, she's saying he's a problem, end of story, but this was preventable. Kids leave home, they run away from home. Right. And now the parents, what are they going to say? Rebellious kid, black sheep of the family, as we say in our Urdu, right? Like, do you understand this was all preventable? Mm -hmm. All these things were preventable. But now you want to go from making a statement, nothing is wrong, to saying that person was wrong. So if we as a society can realize that there's things that are not kosher right now in our home, something's not right in my life, before it ends up at the end result, which isn't a result, that always has to be, you yeah. know, and it work. Yeah, I think what I, the mindset that's around that, why they don't do it, is that, oh, everything has to be in the family. Hush, hush, hush. You should yeah. not get out of the family. I think that's goes your laundry too. No, no, yes. And then so, they don't, the concept of like everything is done in the family is so much embedded in us in our culture. And that's why we don't go out and seek professional help. So I think we need to educate that the professional help that we have the, it's like enclosed doors. Um, there's things called hyper compliant in right. psychiatry. You cannot tell people, you know, even your colleagues, you can't talk about a patient mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because you can, because in, um, the, the good thing about being here, the, there's such rules and regulations about what you can say, what you cannot say. So I just want to tell people that it's okay. It still will be in, it'll be hush hush. You still have that hush hush in a, with a person who can just objectively sit down with you very neutrally, can look at and help you sort out this so that you are not, um, you're not out in the community, first of all. And at the same time, you're solving the problem in a, in a contained environment. So I think we don't understand that. Our community doesn't understand that. And that's why they just want to avoid and they want to they come only at the last minute. Sure. Yes, if the, I agree with you. If they come early on mm -hmm. and, and, and leave that, like help get that professional help, mm -hmm. yes, definitely. I think a lot of it is preventable. Well, you yeah. know, America, sorry, just last thing <laughs> on this, America gives you that HIPAA compliant as an extra layer of, mm -hmm. uh, of mental security. Mm -hmm. Whereas our Islam, HIPAA isn't global, mm -hmm. right? But Islam is global. Mm -hmm. And Islam gives us two principles, which all prophets, peace be upon him, said. Inni lakum nasihli ameen. I'm a well-wisher, like I really care about you, and I'm trustworthy. That whatever we discuss ain't going out. And that's why Allah Jisu bil Amana, the Prophet peace be upon him, said that every gathering is a trust in itself. So in addition to the fact that you are in a cultural mindset where we don't want people to know about our problems, in Islam that was never supposed to be the case because your problems will stay with the people you converse it with. And those people are supposed to be trustworthy and your well-wishers. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, that's a great point. Uh, as you deal with the society, Imam, is, it, is this problem kind of more prevalent in the South Asian population? Uh, how do we deal with the stigmatization? Uh, because if I'm going through a problem, uh, the first concern I have is if I go to an imam or if I go to uh, any masjid to seek counseling or help, uh, I might become the talk of the town. So my social image is kind of priority for me and that prevents me from seeking help. Mm -hmm. I've seen a big shift prior to COVID to post-COVID. Mm -hmm. Prior to COVID, it was like, okay, imam, we want to talk to you, but we don't want to talk in the masjid. Because the fact that people yeah. see two people coming into my office, yeah. it would be chit chat. Oh, they must have some problem. Mm -hmm. Now, what it is, people don't care. They're coming in. Uh, that social stigma aspect is is no longer there. In, during COVID, we had a we had a re evolution uh, of how these problems. I've tried to mediate thirty five year old marriages, and I saw six months marriages break. Both of them breaking. Uh, and, and what happened was it was a total chaos across the mm -hmm. spectrum. So right now we're in a position where the immigrant generation set a standard that the children felt compelled to fall 
follow, but they're falling while they're following that. Uh, and, and so as a society, this is my outlook. The immigration generation set a trend. They did great, but they also set a trend where their children will suffer, their grandchildren will be lost, but their great-grandchildren will set a new tone. There's going to have to be a four-generation process in this, not just for how our communities function, how our mental health thought processes, how we protect our youth. Like Everything will have to go, in my opinion, after I've assessed how Chicago is and how Michigan is. There are four generations. We're like second generation going into third generation. There's... We're, we're in a so is it more cycle. kind of a wave like pattern, right? It's Once we hit the seabed, the only way is to go up and get better in the next uh, few generations. So let me add to that. Um, I think also COVID brought in um, um, the Zoom world. So mm -hmm. I think that to, for some people out there listening, if you're worried about um, uh, somebody seeing you or being aware. So what has helped in my practice and clinic is Zoom has, or the video um, chat has definitely opened up that channel. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, I recommend people, like if you're really worried about that, you there a lot of the providers are doing, you know, these uh, mm -hmm. uh, telepsych video options. So you can use that. So you don't, nobody would know. And that's HIPAA compliant. Yes, and that's HIPAA compliant. You'll be in your home, sitting in your couch like this, in your own room if you want to, like even if you don't want, like if you're an adult, you know, you don't want your wife or your husband or somebody, like even if you're an adult child, you don't want your parents to know, you could be in there, nobody would know. You could really be so much discreet as much as possible. So you would have those sessions uh, discreetly, completely, dis uh, you know, so, so I think that this that, that's an advantage of having this, um, this new digital world has given that edge for psychiatry specifically. Because I agree with you, because a lot of times in the my biggest concern is when the patient comes to the clinic, they're all sitting there waiting in office, right? Then they all know who's what, where. And then sometimes that's hard for a lot of the, and I've told patients like in the past, like if you're really worried, sit in your car, we'll call you for your appointment. When your appointment comes, you can just come to the office. Right. So I've done those kind of things. I Because they're, so what I'm trying to say is, there are ways you can get that help. I, you know, there now that with the technology, it's even opened up so many channels. Yeah. If you're worried about discretion, you really can. So I think that's going to help change that, help with that mindset overall. So what I've noticed on my side is, despite having those opportunities, that immigrant generation is still hesitant. Yeah. The sure. younger, the, their children, yeah. they, don't, they don't mind entering an office. Right. They don't mind getting on Zoom. They don't mind getting on Google Meet. Yeah. Uh, but it, it's interesting how these dynamic plays out. I think the factoring generation, I think mm -hmm. that's a factor, but also... The, the severity of the situation. Yeah. If the severity of the situation compels you, you'll, you like, we had a case once, the wife literally beat the husband up, bringing him into the masjid, and they were fighting outside, and we had to call for security because it was going out of hand. So when you're tipping, you have no control of yourself anymore. You don't care about what's happening around you also. So... I think it's very important for people to realize you don't have to tip to realize there's a problem. Mm -hmm. Everything that led up to it was explaining to you, we're going the wrong direction. So yeah, discretion so, is, yeah. Problem. I'm sure there, there, are, there are red flags uh, leading up to any major outcomes, right? Sure. But uh, let me take a step back, right? Mm -hmm. We talk like all about like severe cases, depression, anxiety, suicides. Uh, but even if a normal person uh, on a day-to-day -day life might be going through stress, uh, might be going through some tough situations, it all happens in everybody's life. Uh, so how can one differentiate that this is a regular problem, the regular stress, I need to have a good coping mechanism to deal with it, versus now I have crossed the line, I need to seek a medical help or a spiritual help. So, I mean, uh, let me go to your question. question. So and if you look at... Um, so in psychiatry, there's a book called DSM-5, Diagnostic Statistic Manual. So um, so it's kind of like the book that you go by um, that kind of gives you a guideline if you have a disorder, right? Mm -hmm. So in the guidelines, uh, the key thing is, yes, you have those symptoms. When you have any symptoms, it has when those symptoms would affect you two or more areas of your life. Like it could be your home life, work life, um, school life. Any, if it's affecting in two more of your areas of your life and you have those symptoms, that's definitely uh, a, like, yes, you need to go seek professional help. 
So, but if you're just having like a acute moment in your life, a stressors, and then you're able to resolve it, and then you moved on with normal life, if functioning is normal, then you're okay. But then if your functioning does decreases and, and not only decreases for that moment in life, but over a period of time. So some disorders, you need at least two weeks period of time. Some you need six months. It depends on what disorder you're looking at. So it's consistency, your functioning is decreasing and you're maintaining those uh, dysfunctional uh, symptoms, then yes, you definitely need to come seek out help. But if you like normal weight stuff, yeah, you're okay. Okay, so let me add like another question uh, to it. At what, at what point one need to see a psychologist versus psychiatrist? Because uh, mm -hmm. from a common uh, man's perspective, a psychologist and a psychiatrist, they're almost the same, right? Yes, I, I get that question a lot. So a lot of times, especially our you know, population, they come to me because I'm a psychiatrist. So psychiatrist means, so I want, I've gone into medical school, right? So I have my medical school training. And then after that, I did my residency specialized in psychiatry. So um, I'm evaluating more on first of all, the chemical imbalance, looking at if there's a need for medication. Okay. Psychologists in another has they have not gone into medical school. They've gone, they've done basically it, some of them have done like bachelor's in psychology and then either master's in psychology and or just their straight psych D psychology doctorate. So they're just looking at more of the psychological evaluation, they're doing psychological testing, they're doing more on the therapy side, right? They're they're the therapists. Right. So we are more on the Easy way to differentiate is we're looking at more the medication management. They're looking at more on the therapy side. Now, there's, a, there's some overlap occurs because we do some therapy also as a psychiatrist, but we're, that's not our uh, forte. It's more like medication management. So because yes, our, I know our community, they come to me thinking that I'm a psychologist, like I'm going to be doing therapy, and which is fine. So the first appointment, uh, they get a little discouraged. And like, I'm talking about medications, like, because I'm already validating for that. But I have educated and tell them this is what it is. And then it's up to them if they want to be on medication or not. So what they could do is, it doesn't matter if they go to a psychologist or a psychiatrist, just get help. When you go to the professional, they will guide you. They'll tell you, like, if let's just say they end up seeing me, I'll tell you, like I said earlier, look, I, I validated you. I think these, this is the treatment you need to look at. You need to go see a therapist, which is a psychologist or a therapist. Um, and then, you know, then you, you also see me follow up because I also feel there's a need for medication. Then if you feel you can come back and I can do med evaluation even further and get you started on medication. But I just say, end up seeing a psychologist, they can evaluate them and say, look, I think I um, definitely need therapy, but the therapy also will you benefit being on medication. So I'm going to refer to you as a psychiatrist to get on medication also. So they could, so either way, you, it's so, uh, and as long as I but, the, but the more important thing is to get help yes, first, yes, and yes. then uh, so, you'll be evaluated based on the severity. Yeah, from the, yes. so a spiritual perspective, yes. you are on the hind end of the spectrum. And I'll explain to you, there's care, there's maintenance, mm -hmm. there is major repair. So for example, if you have a car, you have to daily take care of it. What does that mean? Uh, put a screen on when you're parking so that he doesn't get in, roast your car, check your air tire pressure, fill up the gas, fluid for your window wiper. This is care, okay? Maintenance, you're talking about rotations, alignment, oil change. And then you're talking about like projects engine, uh, you know, transmission, something big. Islamically, from a spiritual aspect, he's that engine transmission specialist that's going to come in. And, but in our spiritual life, in our Islam, we have the care regimen. What's the care regimen? That every day as humans, we are going to fill up. So I want you to put in your head these boxes. We all have these compartments in our head every day that's there. Okay? One is anger depression, stress, anxiety, happiness, just put a whole bunch of boxes. Right. Now, uh, what happens is when one of them starts filling up, you know, my anger levels are rising, I'm getting to 90, 95. What happens now is that I'm not in a healthy position. Allah has given us something called sleep. And he talks about, uh, Okay, وَجَعَلْنَا نَوْمَكُمْ subata. Sleeping at night mm -hmm. is therapeutic. Mm -hmm. Okay? And the thing is, what bothers me, like I finished a class at stage 12 o'clock and I had to go grab something. On the way back, across from the masjid, there's this restaurant and people are out there sitting, talking. That's not the time to eat. You know, our Desi culture, our Arab culture is a testimony of us 
actively destroying our mental well-being. From the care aspect, if I don't have gas in my car, I'm harming my engine. If my air tire pressure is low, I can have a major accident. So this is called mismanagement of care. And when we sleep at night, what happens is a lot through the night sleep, which is from 10 to 5. Okay, you got your seven hours here. You got not only spiritual rejuvenation, physical rejuvenation, but mental rejuvenation. Mm -hmm. When I wake up in the morning, you know that anger that was hitting at 93, 95? It's zero now. Mm -hmm. You know, all Correct. the levels neutralize. My stress levels, I'm at work, I'm in stress, I got anxiety stuff. But nighttime, it's supposed to deplete that. Yes. Okay? And in the morning, you start fresh again. And of course, you're going to face scenarios, but you have leverage. Yes. What happens if we don't sleep at night? And if we don't eat at the right time, mm -hmm. what we've done is, what did Nabi Sallallahu do? Look at his sunnah. There's an Arabic saying, إِذَا تَغَدَّ تَمَدَّ وَإِذَا تَعَشَّ تَمَشَّ When you eat lunch, sleep. When you eat dinner, go for a walk. So you have to give yourself time to digest the food at night, not eating at 2 o'clock in the morning and sleeping at 3. What happens when we keep the sleep and food regimen in good check? Mm -hmm. We are mentally, physically able to take on what the world sends to us. That's our daily care. And Allah has given the Muslims uh, a structure of scheduling their life no other religion has. Fajr, Zohar, Asr, Maghrib, Isha is structure of life. You know what you need to do? You wake up before Fajr. That means you have to sleep enough to wake up for Fajr. And then Zohar is call it quits. Asr, call it quits. Maghrib, call it quits. Meaning you have to know when to break away. And prayer in congregation is break away from my work, break away from my stressors, break away from my family, mm -hmm. and go and change environment. Because now this is now the maintenance. I'm going from the care to maintenance. Maintenance is where you realize that by being in a situation constantly isn't going to help you. So our religion has given us so many mechanisms of daily care and maintenance that shouldn't take us to constantly jumping to the major projects and overhauls. However, when we're not daily care, now, uh, give, give example, our kids are not sleeping all night. They're on TikTok all night. They sleep all day. Allah will not allow those levels to reset. So if they slept with 95 anger, they wake up with 96. One small thing happens in the kitchen in the morning, mom goes, now you're waking up, he's tipped 100. Now that anger is going into their anxiety, into their happiness, and so it's this is like a flood. And as it floods, there's only one thing that they're doing because everything else, all their other faculties mentally have been compromised. So it's more kind of a lifestyle and self-inflicted uh, well, problems yeah. uh, that in fact, uh, they are manifesting on the healthcare side. Mm -hmm. But now as we are talking about psychiatric issues, uh, they are kind of directly, I feel that is correlated. So, yeah, when you go to a therapist or you come to us, that those are the things we talk about. And those are things that I evaluate for. Sleep, energy, appetite, focus, concentration, because these are important things. And I agree with you, a lot of times the sleep uh, is deprived majority of the time, and a lot of our psychiatric disorders are related to sleep. If you correct the sleep, most of them do go away, especially in depression and anxiety. But um, I'm gonna add to the point where, let's just say you do all of this, like you go to your original question, when do we get seek professional help? Some of it, most of it is like self-inflicted, but there are times it's not self-inflicted, where these big mechanical things have changed in your brain, it affects your sleep, affects your energy level. Mm -hmm. so that so that's how you get that professional love. let's just say you're dry, you're doing all these mechanics and, and you're still struggling that's the time to get professional yeah. help mm -hmm. because that's when you the, the therapist can sit down and give, give you a little bit more tips maybe figure out where you're going if that still doesn't work then you definitely need to come to us where that medication comes in place will help you fall asleep at night take care of that make that, that whole mechanic piece that it's like there's that imbalance that's occurring causing for these normal things not to occur so that's also absolutely. Percent. That's also is there. You have a new car, a hundred miles in, and there's making a sound that the tires are not making. The gas stop. You have to go to the expert. What's going on here? Oh, you got a problem in your fuel, or you have a, in your gas line, or your engine. So the experts are always on standby, and that's we talk about the collaboration for people to realize something abnormal has happened to me. Mm -hmm. I'm not able to sleep at night. It's not I'm actively staying awake. No, I just can't sleep, mm -hmm. and that's why you must, as Dr. Sa saying, you must seek out the help. Yeah. Please so please. yeah, it's very important, and then, so that's why in, uh, there's a concept called life coaches occurs in America. 
So these are, they're not exactly therapists, they're called life coaches. This is what they're doing. They're kind of keeping you in training. So I tell my, like, if it's, we call it like maintenance therapy. Let's just say you've gone to therapy, you've done this. We recommend you should kind of do maintenance like every month or follow up with somebody who kind of looks at the bigger picture. Or you, and then see yourself, where you are standing, and then kind of come back to that. So yeah, I agree. These life skills are small, are very, very important. The sleep hygiene, eating healthy, exercise, everything plays a role. Everything, everything. I think a few eye-opening points for myself too. Uh, Imam Azhar, how do you uh, demarcate, like uh, somebody comes to you, let's say for a certain XYZ problem, right? At what point do you decide or recommend them that this is more kind of beyond counseling or help? You actually need to see a psychiatrist or you might need to consider yourself for medications. Uh, have you faced any scenarios? So I learned this from Imam Sahib Webb. And Imam Sahib Webb gave me great advice. And he's like a mentor to me and a big brother that we must know our territory. <laughs> and we must accept to stay within that territory. And I always talk about lanes, like Toronto has the largest highway, I think, in North America, the 401, I think it's what, uh, 16 lanes, one way each. Wow. Each person must stay in their lane. Mm -hmm. And so for us as scholars, we must recognize and have the ability to identify that this case is beyond my control. And that is why we need to work in collaboration with therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, that we can say, okay, this has to be referred. So there's a three tier system that we had adopted at the masjid at one time, which was if we get a call that there's a problem, there's one of three options. Either this problem will be channeled to the scholar or it will be channeled to our mental health experts or it's a 911. Because, and that's why we had operators who would take these calls and be trained to understand where these cases have to go. So system is what I'm alluding to. We must create systems where we're able to bounce off each other, realizing this case is in my head. And you don't just tell them, go to someone else. We must hold their hand and make those connections. That's very important. Got it. No, that's a very good point. Something we have in healthcare is what we call as triage system, right? Mm -hmm. When a patient walks in, yeah. uh, we decide the severity or the complexity of the problem. And sure. based on that, we direct or channel them mm -hmm. uh, to the appropriate care. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think during COVID, I know the uh, Epic Masjid was trying to do that. They're trying to have that triage system too, to help. Uh, I agree with you there, that triage system needs to be, we need to have system in bottom line, yeah, to help with our community overall in general. So you talk about COVID a lot, right? And mm -hmm. the thing is, COVID didn't do anything to us, realistically. COVID exposed the reality of our situation. Yes. Because before COVID, we were all living in a house, but we weren't having, living a family. Because, you know, I have to be at work at six in the morning. I have to go to the subway at seven. Like, everyone had something to do. But now when you brought them together and said, no, you're not going out <laughs> today. You're not going to school today. We realized that we had nothing in common, except that we are blood. One's a father, one's a mother, one's a son, one's a daughter. So COVID exposed the reality and factuality of a family structure, of an individual's mental state. Because what we do good as humans is we love running from our problems. And we feel if you can run far enough, we'll get far away from that problem that we'll forget it. But we don't realize there's a chain hanging from us to our problems. And as we run, we're dragging it with us. So COVID, in fact, uh, helped us in exposing our real selves. A blessing in disguise. A blessing in disguise. If you look into the hand side. I want to make sure that no one takes me wrong. But I had COVID three times, okay? So I suffered greatly. But what scenario COVID brought us, not COVID itself, the scenario that it brought, that it secluded us, it, it confined us. Those who lived alone, it was an exacerbating mental health. It, it was bad. Because I remember... In 2020, uh, that January, I think I gave a khutbah on how the World Health Organization had stated that the greatest threat facing humanity at large is loneliness. Mm -hmm. It was the biggest threat to our world. Mm -hmm. And then in March, COVID came. Yes. Okay. So for those who are already alone, this was the worst experience. Those who are in homes with others, this was a learning experience. Yeah. But that what scenarios COVID brought on the world was a blessing in disguise because it allowed us to realize 
Do we have a house or do we have a home? Do we have a family or do we just have people? Are we able to uh, find happiness here? Or are we just so miserable that we want to run from here? But COVID itself, of course, was. So are these the problems of uh, the modern society? Because uh, uh, like, again, back in the days, let's say at least a century ago, there is a struggle for survival, right? So if you go out to work, you are not sure whether you're going to have dinner on the table or not. So sometimes too many blessings, is it, is it a curse for the society? Um, I, I, I mean, it, it depends who you are, how you look at it. Um, it it's it, how much you're involved in it. And, you know, what's, uh, it, you know, it could be a curse. I just say if, if, if you all rely on the society, the worldly things, then it's a curse. But if you take advantage of it, use it the right way, then it's, an, it's, an, it's a benefit. I mean, like you were talking about a Zoom video or internet, it's a, it could be both curse and it could be, it could be a benefit because there's so much knowledge out there. So it seems like it's a double-edged sword, like based on how we uh, utilize our resources and how we utilize our blessings. So if not utilized properly, uh, it might be counter counterproductive. I don't think it's a double-edged sword because in our history, we've had people who Allah gave an abundance of wealth, that's like in the Sahaba, Mansa Musa, or, you know, Suleiman Naisam. And then there's those who, uh, Ashab Sufa, who even have clothing to cover their body. Uh, it goes down to how you receive it and utilize it. In Islam, if you're doing it with shukr, you will never feel addicted to it. Mm -hmm. And if you're not doing shukr and sabr, then you're going to have a need for it. So our society has opened the floodgates of luxuries. The thing about human nature is once it's exposed to luxury, it likes it, right? You, you tell a person, go fight business class, they will never fly coach and economy again because they're pampered. They don't want to go backwards unless they have the mindset of a Muslim, which is this is an opportunity, alhamdulillah, mashallah. And if it's not, alhamdulillah, mashallah. Islam keeps us in a physically fluid state. We could sleep on the throne uh, in Burj, uh, Burj Al Arab on a twenty, thirty thousand dollars room a night. And we could also sleep on the floor the next day. It goes down to how you receive those benefits. If not, the fall from there is very tough. Is it also that in our lives, in our social lives, uh, professional lives, are we living more uh, comparing to each other? Are we living for ourselves or are we living for others just to make sure that uh, I put my best face forward? And for any reason, if I'm not able to for uh, any challenges, then the depression, anxiety sucks. Well, we've, this, is a, this is a global cultural issue. We all are living to show off to others. You know, the rich people. Look at Mark Zuckerberg and them. I've never seen him wear Gucci. I've never seen him wear like, you know, uh, Fendi or anything else. They wear the simple white t-shirt and jeans. Mark, uh, what's his name? Bill Gates. You won't see him wearing brand name clothing because he doesn't need to flex. He's successful to the world. Right. But in our society, the people who actually go to the Gucci and Louis Vuitton, who are these people? People who want to make a statement to society. I'm also there. Right. So I'm going to add to that. I think that I, I've heard Hamzi, uh, Sheikh Hamzi talk about this. Mm -hmm. he, he uses that I, you know, everything that I world, I this, I this. And it's like we're so self into our nafs. We just want to feed ourselves. Uh, our own ego and uh, this is that that i society we've become it's all about us it's just um you just want to self-fulfill at that nuts that we are in so it's we... not more towards uh, western or north american society i i guess it's kind of all over the world right now. yeah well because we, we facilitated the means for you to do that so the i uh is a problem the nuts is a problem but you see Every human being, Allah has created with them, within them is this tendency that they want to be recognized, they want to be appreciated, they want to be loved, they want to be acknowledged, okay? If you keep these four staples, Allah said, I've been, I've been and I am doing all these for you. Mm -hmm. But if you disconnect yourself from Allah, you seek it from the people. Uh -huh. And that's what, you know, if you tell someone, go out there and buy a two uh, $250,000 Ferrari, in my opinion, very few people in America have that cash and that uh, desire to go and do that. But if I put that same car on monthly installments of $2,800, $3,200, people do have the money to do that. So not only does society facilitate the opportunities that, look, you have all these cars, but it facilitates that 
the, the ability to actually to do actually that. And so people then will drive the car that isn't affordable to them. They will live in a house that is not in their needs. It's beyond their needs. All so that people say, mashallah, that guy is amazing. That family is really successful. Now there's two, it's a, this is where the double-edged sword is. You know your hakikat, your reality, and, and, and you're struggling now to uphold that face. But then what you've done is you've caused a, a ripple effect. Now, this family that's looking at you is fighting within their family, how come we're not successful? When in actuality, if you were to see things from afar, they're not successful. You are actually better off. So Islam tells us live within our means. Have you seen this in more in one gender compared to the other versus in one society compared to the other society? I see it happening across. Yeah, I think it is across. I think it's more global. I don't think it's gender. I think it's everybody. Um, and I think it's, uh, yeah, no, I think it's more, yeah. I really think we're just kind of coming back to Islam. And we talked about in psychology too, is that, you, you know, they just, we want to, it's that um, feeling of, that inside internal feeling of uh, that uh, restlessness. They, they need that constant gratification. They need something to be praised about. They just, they, either to materialistic things or something. So that, that, that's why when pe pe patients come to me and I see that so many, um, and they don't have that, that long-term picture, like, you know, this, this world is temporary, that there's that hereafter, you know, that slum that gives us to that, mm -hmm. that hereafter picture. We don't, if, if you don't have that, I think that, that restlessness I see, you know, that the spirituality they talk about, that, you know, you, you could be physically taking care of yourself so much, but if you're not taking care of yourself spirituality, I think that that disconnect is what causes that restlessness, constantly seeking happiness from outside world, that contentment. People don't have that contentment uh, in, in the society. I see that all the time. So I know a, a lot of times when I see patients and they're not Muslim or they're not religious based, it's very hard for me. It becomes to, like when I, I told you earlier about saying that biopsychosocial factor, mm -hmm. that is so important. Like, okay, see a therapist, if you have a spiritual leader, see that person too, because you got to have that balance. We're not just made up of, you know, because I know in Islam, we, the concept is we're made up of two things, right? From this world and also from the spirit world, from the rule, we talk about the spirit. So if you're just taking care of the worldly things here, but you're not taking care of that, there's that disconnect. I see it all the time. And then they're never happy. They're just, the, the, the contentment is not there. So yeah. sometimes uh, people say that less is more. Uh, because uh, usually people who are poor are kind of like uh, on an average pay scale tend to be more happier compared to people who are more affluent. Uh, well, there are studies done. There's yeah. movies on Netflix about you know this like where is where are people who are happy? Um, Edi, uh, who in Pakistan mm -hmm. created one of the greatest um, service to humanity of uh, hospitals, ambulances, orphanages, and stuff. He never changed his standard of living. Yeah. He ate the same food, wearing the same clothes on the same floor in the same house. So it's not about in Islam, but having materialism, having materialistic goods doesn't mean it's wrong. It mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Having the mindset that yeah. this doesn't define me, this doesn't satisfy yes. me, this doesn't fulfill yeah. me is what spirituality gives you. But right. this doesn't define me. But today we're saying this defines me. And that's where the problem is. Yeah. Look at the end of the day is. This is a very broad topic. And every person must realize that we all need help yeah. and we all need someone. If you look like a candle, a candle gives light to an entire room, but the immediate surrounding of the candle is dark. We don't understand our situation because we are in the dark. Someone else will be able to help us by filling in that darkness with their light. And when you talk about like uh, uh, growth of abundance of wealth and stuff, it's like a tree. The more uh, broader the tree becomes, it looks beautiful from the top. What it's actively doing, it's killing the grass around it because it's depriving it from the sunlight and sometimes from the water that it needs. And so that's why sometimes if you look at your houses, one side the grass is growing between two houses, but on the other side the grass is dead because it's deprived of water or sunlight. What we need is a balanced approach. Yes. What we need is a balanced mindset. And you don't have to be religious 
to uh, it doesn't mean I have to be super religious mm -hmm. to be protected from Islam. I just need to incorporate a religious mindset mm -hmm. that allows me to live within boundaries that as Dr. Sepp said, some people who are not religious, it's more difficult because they don't have anything to fall back onto. And as Islam or anyone with a religion, they have something to fall back onto. Yeah. And we must be compassionate. Yeah, and they're constantly seeking that. Perspective. I see that they're constantly seeking, like, I don't know why I'm not happy. I hear that all the time. I have, and we know people who have everything, worldly things. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, you know, they're, they're well off, but then they're not happy. They're, and then I, I give them at a, at a depressant, they go see a therapist. They're doing all the right things, but they're just, they're still, they feel that missing link, you know, the piece. So it's, it's a combination. It's a holistic approach. You, you have to have it all. Um, and then for that balance, as Imam saying, you got to have that balance. Then you feel like complete. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Just out of curiosity, uh, Dr. Sadri, what are like are the top two or three most commonly diagnoses in psychiatry you see on a day, on a on a rising basis, right? And how do you handle uh, patients who lack insight? Because one of the main problems I see in in patients or in society in general that if somebody is suffering, uh, there is no acknowledgement, or probably that could be there is no insight to to the problem. Yeah, yes, very much true. So the, first of all, the first question that most common disorders that come to our clinic is anxiety and depression. Those are the two most common people come in with. And they are arise. Yeah, and that arise. And uh, so and usually if they're coming to get help, they're, they already have some sort of an insight they need help. Now, in broad general, who are suffering depression and anxiety, they lack insight. I think it's coming back to that mindset is like, I need to take care of myself. It's it's my problem. It belongs to me. I don't need to share with anybody. Uh, or there's something wrong with me that I need to fix. And maybe my dean is not right. Uh, you know, all those things that they have that um, negative thinking about themselves, about themselves and others. I think it's what prevents them. It's just a lack of awareness. I mean, it's just that's what it is. Basically, they, they need that understanding that no, you have an issue. You need to get help. Yeah. And sometimes maybe it's a matter of prestige that if somebody points out towards me yeah. that, hey, you might need help, then I'm reluctant that right. I don't have a problem and I don't need help. Right, right. So right. your take on it, Imam? The thing is that, you know, I think Islam will come back because people value I'm saying within the Muslim community, the rise of Islam uh, and the appreciation of Islam will return once people realize after breaking it all down what it was actually providing in the first place. In the Quran, it talks about Allah alayhim wa la hum that there'll be no fear, there'll be no grief. Depression is about, oh my God, that happened, this has happened, the anxiety, what's going to happen. And it, this mental state is like a fish out of water or someone who is fixated on the spilt milk. And so spirituality gives you the tools to help you fix, salvage, and move on constructively. It's not going to change the status quo. For example, if a person's lost their marriage, they lost their marriage. It's done, right? The court has signed off on it. It's done. She's gone. He's gone. It's done. How do you pick yourself up? Mm -hmm. A lot of people who are going through bad marriages, for example, or they're in separation mode, they're now going to flex their ability to lose weight, go to the gym, drive a new car. They're going to show off their life. Look, I'm good without you. That is a mental cry. That's a person crying. I need help. Help me. They need someone to hold their shot say, you know what? Let's slow down. You're not, this is not the way to go. And as you get the professional help, the medication to confront anxiety, which is like, again, fish out of the water, depression, spilled milk, and you're fixated. The Quran through spirituality helps you accept, first actually acknowledge the reality, accept the reality, appreciate whatever you have, and start moving. And in the example you mentioned about the broken marriages, mm -hmm. right? So... So broken marriages is, could be an outcome of the long-standing depression or the anxiety uh, either of the spouses for going through. So if it would have been fixed way earlier or if they would have consulted an imam or went to a psychiatrist and got treatment or counseling, whatever that needed was, this, this marriage could have been saved. Well, you're talking about marriages. Let me just take it back. Our parents had deficiencies 
from a physical, psychological, spiritual perspective. It's like cheese with holes, right? But then when they produce children, since they both brought incomplete cells, they create also more incomplete people. Mm -hmm. Now these incomplete children are now coupling up. So we have more holes and we have stable ground, right? So what I ask people to do is, especially when they're going into second marriages, is go see an expert, mm -hmm. a professional, yes. Fix problems and don't bring this luggage on because we're pushing the luggage on. There is opportunities in our lives to become whole. Our parents may not have been whole and that's not their fault. It's just the construction of how society was. You have an opportunity to become whole and holistic in your approach. So you and your spouse are two whole and complete people, physically, spiritually, and mentally, so that when you produce the next offspring, they're also going to have more strong, uh, more strength in them. It's a ripple effect. Yes. You're talking about they could have solved the issues of their marriage. They could have also solved their individual issues that exacerbated their marital issues that led to the divorce. So, so there's always an opportunity to uh, fix your holes yeah. before getting into a serious and relationship. That's what we're here for. And I think the, the, the reason, one of the reasons is that we're, we're a society of perfection. We build a society, everything has to be perfect. Everything has to be in order. Everything has to be this way. Our souls kind of, kind of mindset is so uh, evolves around it. We get stuck in it. And then, and then that's when you look at other people, you compare yourself and, and then you feel like, well, that, you know, it's not me, it's them, or I, I, you know, it has to be this way. So we have to recognize that, you know, nobody's perfect except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are the, we are imperfect. We that's the bottom line. We're imperfect. Even though we say it, but we don't acknowledge it. We don't believe that. We still want to create that perfection. We are still looking for that perfect world in this, the heaven, the, the, you know, we want to create that. And, but that doesn't exist. And that, then what you, have, what have you on earth? Yeah. Yeah. And you, and you, you fall because it doesn't exist. You're not perfect. The world around you is not perfect. Nothing is perfect. That's the first thing. And that's why I tell my patient, like, look, realize like you, the, the thing is, I can help you, but that mindset it needs to occur that the medication or therapy I'm going to product, help you, it, it's going to a certain degree is going to help you, but you're going to have to realize that there's a limitation to that. There's a, you know, there's a limitation for everything. So that's the thing that we struggle with. Recognize our limitations and learn how to live with them, not to change ourselves. Like we, we're so focused on um, changing other people. It's, it's, it's like all about other we could, I want to change you. Like it's your fault. You need to change. No, no, it's about you looking at your limitations, accepting your limitations, accepting the limitations of the person in front of you, accepting who they are. And then two limitations, two people with different limitations, different sets. That's what makes it perfect. That's, that, that's what makes, when you two people join, they're uh, different. You complement each other. And that's why I think a lot of marriages lack that they're complementing each other. They want to change that other partner. But they, they, I, I think we also have to acknowledge it's okay to have deficiencies. Yes, right. Uh, Nobody is perfect. Yes. And the sooner we acknowledge uh, this and accept it, probably the better life is going to be. I think we are heading towards a very great discussion. It's an eye-opening and a lot of learning for me. Uh, I also feel that uh, it's not justifiable to talk about such an important and serious issue in just one episode. So, Imam, are there any final points to take home? I think uh, it's always good to listen to different perspectives. We are a society where we become accustomed to just listening to people, service experts, service matters, uh, experts on special issues and stuff, scholars on different topics. It's good to listen. But it's always then good. What's better is to take what we've heard and assess ourselves with that knowledge and be open to change because the difference between information and knowledge is knowledge changes you, information just through and through. And so um, you're not a problem. Your life is not a curse. That was a bit love because you have problems, you have challenges, and this life is a test, and a test has challenges. So we are able to identify, it's a blessing of Allah. We're able to constructively address it, it's a blessing from Allah. And inshallah, we will be able to rise from it and get beyond it because that too is a blessing of Allah in the way. Thank you so much, uh, Imam Wazir, for your time. I really appreciate your Thank feedback. You so, so Dr. Khadri, uh, what do you recommend as a lifestyle changes for people who are going through tough times or maybe going through some depression, anxiety? Uh, is it something preventable? Uh, or if they have already been in the situation, 
uh, what do they do next? Yeah, right. So I think preventive is a good uh, way to start. So we live in a society right now, it's a stressful society. There's a lot going on, right? Uh, we have to kind of do the normal stuff first, getting your sleep in order, um, diet is in, in a check, you have a good healthy relationship, somebody to talk to end of the day. If you have these kind of these three things, normal lifestyle, normal things you're doing, you'll be able to handle normal life and day stressors pretty good because your sleep is a big, uh, I call it as like a battery charge. You know, it just charges you, you get up fresh, rested. If you're eating healthy, the food is gonna give you that energy, you feel good. Um, and then at the, and there's things that still you need to bounce back. You know, there are things that's gonna be bothering you at the end of the day. And then you talk to your person. Uh, in my practice, I tell a lot of my, um, I'm a child psychiatrist, so I see a lot of parents and kids. There's always a communication gap with children and adolescents. So I, I give them this advice and say, you know, it's very simple. I don't have dinner together. Even if you don't eat together, at least sit down together. A lot of times, you know, everybody's eating dinner at their own TVs or in their media. Nobody's doing it. Have a day every day in the evening time. Sometime, it doesn't have to be a whole hour, five, 10 minutes, to, you know, just together, all of, you know, family members, basically just talking about their day. And then sometimes they ask me like, what do you, what, how do you talk about a day? What do you do? What do you say? And I say, okay, think of three facts and three opinion of your day. Just three facts and three opinions. So I give them an example, like simple as like, oh, I got up this morning, brushed my teeth. Oh, I was so tired getting up this morning. So you got a fact and you got a, then I, like I'm talking about a teenager or a school, person's going to school. I went to my first period English class. Oh my God, the teacher was so like the best. Like they woke me up. So you talked about that, you went to class and an opinion, how it helped you. Then I came back around three o'clock at home. So this guy, so I tell them, Go through the day like that, at least three facts and opinion, and the parents can do the same thing. Mom and dad, like, you do the same thing too. You you tell what was your, you know, like, oh, you got up this morning and you drove the car to work, but there was no gas. I had to rush and it was so, I'm so stressed out doing it. Kind of like that. So engaging yourself in conversations. So when you start talking, that itself is a solution to many problems and it can act uh, as a prevention. Yeah. I think the same goes with uh, hand in hand, both with, uh, physical health as well as mental health, yeah. right? Uh, I just talked about sleep hygiene, uh, good diet, and maybe exercise yes. uh, can also play a role. Mm -hmm. So I think... Uh, Light walking, just even I tell people, just walk 15, 20 minutes every day. Just a general walk to two of you as you're talking. It's just so healthy. So those are preventive measures. So once, let's just say you're doing that, and then now you ask questions of what can they do, let the, that's still there, but then now it's the point where your stress level, anxiety level is up there, and, and it, it, it just, after doing all that, it's still not working. That's when you take a professional help. Really, you really need to, I mean, get, at least get a opinion. Like, you know, there's always, you could do free consultation. You could do like a first opinion. Like if you don't want to go to their office, now we have options. You could do it on the phone. A lot of therapists, uh, usually therapists, not psychiatrists, they do a 15 minutes free consult. Like, you know, you can, they're online. How do you find a therapist? Very simple. If you have insurance, go to your insurance carrier. And in there, they'll have all the therapists that take your insurance. Just go down in the line, give them a call, do a 15 minute, 10 minute consult, Talk to them and see and see what they can help you. And then they'll usually within 10, 30 minutes, they will tell you, yeah, come to me and uh, I think you need this, this, and they can do that. And nothing else, Google search. I mean, you know, you put the Google word, this is what I'm looking yeah. and you'll find tons of people. I would just start there, if you'd, you know, just talk to somebody like a professional, easy. And then, you yeah, know. yeah, perfect. I think it's a great resource for the community. So any la last golden words, uh, I know time is always not sufficient. So, oh, What's the few points that one one can take home with? Right. I mean, I think my, my last word is just when you're in that situation, it's hard not to tell yourself that you're not alone because that's the key thing. I see that in general, in any disorder, psych disorders, that's the first thing they notice is that they feel lonely, that they have no help, that there's that, like, I'm stuck in this. Like, there's there's nothing outside here. That I, I just, if you can, when you're in there, if you can tell yourself, no, I'm not alone, I have help. If you could do that, I think you'll be able to find that help. Our mind is like Google. If you tell your mind, I need help, it'll start searching. Help. But if you tell your mind, like, no, I'm all alone, I have no word, no help, it shuts down and it doesn't find help for you. So it just saying that in itself, I promise you, you, your mind will start rolling and you will be able to get that help. 
just telling yourself, no, I'm not lonely. I, I, I got people, I have people, I'm going to find it, I'm going to get it. And if you could do that, you will be able to find something. And then I'll be like, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is there. And then, you know, if you believe in God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's, it's, uh, will come, help will come in you when you ask for it. Definitely, definitely. You're a great resource for our community. And if somebody, are, especially for our listeners who are going through or need help or have any questions, is there a way they can reach out to you? Right. And yeah. So um, we have a clinic um, in Richardson. Uh, they can. Uh, um, uh, it's Tech Psychiatry Associate. They can Google that. And then I. Um, we can also provide the information uh, below the screen yeah. at your website. Right. And then ICNA. I volunteer at ICNA. So we have a psychiatrist and a therapist. They could also go there if you're struggling with the financial resources. ICNA uh, Medical Clinic. We have a psych clinic separately. Also have a medical clinic. So uh, definitely the secretary. So especially for those uh, who don't have insurance or have financial financial issues. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Khadri, uh, for your time. Uh, it's a great learning experience and it's a pleasure, That's a pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to have you. It's creating this whole environment and a place to talk. I mean, I'm very happy to be here. And there is a lot more to come uh, because psychiatry is such a diverse and a vast topic uh, that we cannot justify in uh, an hour or two. So sh surely and definitely we'll uh, come up with a lot more uh, interesting topics, a lot more interesting questions from the community. Thank you so much. As humans, we all go through tough times. We all have difficulties. We all face challenges in life. If you are going through any mental health issues, physical health problems, or any other problems, just remember, after every difficulty, there is ease. Help is available. Reach out. Thank you so much for joining and watching Doctor's Couch. Mental health is definitely an important subject for our society and community in general. In future, stay tuned for more interesting topics and more to come on mental health and general health issues. Stay tuned for more.